Good morning. My name is Kara Corbin Lickfit, and it is my privilege to serve as your worship associate for the month of September. The theme this month is reverence, and the broader objective is an invitation to the congregation to think and speak boldly about our faith commitments. Today, our minister, Reverend Kent Doss, will be sharing about his experience in Sacramento this week and why racial justice is an important cause for him. This was quite a subject of uh, conversation last Sunday with my son confused as to why Reverend Kent was going to get arrested. <laughs> that one tested me pretty good. <laughs> this weekend also marks Labor Day and the unofficial end of summer with most kids going back to school. I know my life has become a lot busier since school started and I'm sure most of you with school-age children can relate. Fourth grade is a lot more stressful than I remember it being. <laughs> So in closing, I have a short reading today, which I think fits the theme of our service, by Jack Mendelson. Here in this sanctuary of ancient dreams and wisdom and beauty, we come to grow, to be healed, to stretch mind and heart, to be challenged, renewed, to help in our own continuing struggles for meaning and for love, to help build a world with more justice and mercy in it, to be counted among the hopers and doers. In the face of cynicism, darkness, brutality all around us and within, we seek to align ourselves with a living community that would affirm rather than despair, that would think and act rather than simply adjust and succumb. Here we invite the spirit of our own humanity and the healing powers under, around, through, and beyond it to give us the nerve and grace, the toughness and sensitivity to search out the truth that frees and the life that maketh all things new. So we come together today in community, supporting and encourage each other on our spiritual journeys, affirming the importance of not only of tolerance, but of acceptance, compassion, and open-mindedness. Welcome to Tapestry, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, brief announcements. Uh, please take a look at, in the order of service to see all the events that are going on in Tapestry this week and for the month. I just want to draw your attention to the first one, which is our service auction, which is taking place on September 26. Please uh, get your reservation in to Sue or Kathy um, after the service for the next three weeks. Uh, And now we will light our flaming chalice, the central symbol of our universe, Unitarian Universalist heritage, and Keith Twanaman is going to help with that. Each morning we must hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, and give back. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in ministry and miracle to the universe, to community, and Listen. to each other. Listen to the silence. Listen to the wind, listen to the stars, hear trees, and dance. Dance to the beat of your neighbor's heart. Dance to the rhythm of your childhood dreams. Sing, sing and hum a wordless song to the tune of your rushing blood. And pray. Pray with the fervor that makes you sweat through February. Pray with a fervor that gives you chills in July. Shout your prayer like a howl. Howl till the sound of your soul touches clouds and haunts the moon. Come, let us howl our hallelujah together. Let us pray and sing and celebrate. Come, let us worship together. Welcome to our time to howl and so, worship together. Can anyone tell me what this is? I'm willing to bet, wow, these are California kids. Uh, Grace, a fig, it is a fig. Do any, I bet some of you have fig trees. Do any of you have fig trees in your yard? Yeah, of course, Grace, thank you. 
And I know some of you do. I know, Linda, do you have one? Yes, a couple of hands popping up. Okay, so figs are neat because they grow a lot in the Middle East and in India where a lot of our religious traditions come from. So figs are mentioned a lot in the Bible and in the Jewish tradition and in the Hindu tradition and probably in Buddhism as well. So the story that I have for you today comes from the Hindu tradition. It's about a boy named Svetakatu and his father. So they were walking in the woods, well, not in the woods, in a grove of fig trees, and his father wanted to teach Svetakatu something about their faith. So he plucked one of the figs and he cut it open. So I'm going to do that. And he asked his son, what do you see inside? Seeds. You see seeds, lots and lots of seeds. Great. Um, then he asked his son to cut open one of the seeds. And I'm not going to try that with one of these big knives. But I will give you your own fig to eat. And you might notice that these fig seeds are hollow. You guys can grab one. If you don't like it, there are napkins as well. <laughs> they're a bit of an acquired taste. I think they're delicious. Are they edible? Yes, they're edible. They're, edible. <laughs> they're delicious. If you don't want to try it, you can even have one just to look at. That's fine. There are plenty. It's not going to bite you. It looks a little slimy. So is someone eating it? Okay. So can you, you can sort of bite those little seeds and see how they're hollow, right? There's nothing inside. So Svetagatu's dad said, so I want you to cut this seed open and tell me what you see there. And Svetikot, we all know that these big, glorious fig trees come from these little tiny seeds. And Svetikatu noticed that there's nothing in this seed. It seems to be empty. Um, and so his father explained to him that in all living things, there is something invisible, something that we can't see. Um, and that's what we Unitarians might call the spirit of life. In the Hindu tradition, they would probably call it Brahman, but it's a source of life that's invisible and unnameable, and sometimes you don't even notice it's there, but it's everywhere, even in the middle of a tiny little fig seed, <laughs> and even in each of us. So there ends our stories about Svetakatu and figs. So I hope you enjoy your figs. If you don't, don't your parents might. Um, and we will see you guys in a little bit. Let us class. join together in a short time of silent meditation. Sit back, relax. Feel the embrace of this community. And let us embrace the wisdom of silence together. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. To start today's sermon, I want to ask you to repeat after me a little bit. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. 
We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. I first heard these words at a rally in Santa Ana as we marched in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day and in solidarity with some victims of police violence. I think a handful of tapestry people were there as well. I've heard this chant several times since then, including at the state capitol on Wednesday. And every time I hear this chant, every time I say these words, they resonate with more and more truth because they cut to the core of my faith and values. Now, last week, during sorrows and celebrations, I shared that I was going to Sacramento with a busload of activists, including Bonnie, in support of Assembly Bill 953. And I shared that I was planning on participating in civil disobedience as part of those efforts. So this morning, I want to tell you a little bit about my experience in Sacramento, and I also want to talk about why I have chosen to engage in the struggle for racial justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, I'm, not, I'm sharing this partially because I know some of you are interested in what happened Wednesday. I'm also sharing this story and my personal testimony about why I care as an introduction to the theme of the month. Throughout September, reverence is the theme of our worship services at Tapestry. Now, we could define reverence as responding to an awareness of something greater than ourselves. It's acting and speaking and living in response to the awe and wonder that we know in our hearts. We Unitarian Universalists, for an array of reasons, tend to hold our beliefs very lightly. Many of us are agnostic. We're not sure what we think about the existence of God, or we, know, we believe that it's unknowable. We're casual, and sometimes shy to speak about those things that matter most to us. So today, I offer you a look at my sincere faith, a testimony of why I believe and why I act the way I do. And in so doing, I invite you to look and think about why you believe and act the way you do. I invite you to think about it and feel your truth deeply enough to want to speak that truth to the world. So let's start with Sacramento. For months, an organization that we partner with called OCO has been helping move legislation through the process. It, this piece of legislation is called Assembly Bill 953. Its goal is to reduce racial and identity-based profiling by the police by collecting data about the different categories of people that police are having encounters with, whether it's traffic stops or stop and frisks or whatever. So for months before I went to Sacramento, OCO had sent individuals to meet with assembly mem members and senators to m get us where we were by the time I got on the bus to head up there. Now, the legislative process is incredibly long and complicated. I got a pretty intensive review of my basic civics on this trip to Sacramento. Um, but a lot of work had been done to move this legislation to where it needed to be. A lot of work, including talking to Governor Brown, who basically said forthrightly that he was not interested in signing this piece of legislation. So, Tuesday night, I picked up Bonnie at her home around 9 p.m., and we headed up to the OCO office in Anaheim. We had pizza and got to know each other as more and more people gathered. 
And in that room, we a, went around the circle sharing our name and what personally motivated us to participate in this action. And now I was amazed by how personal and relevant all of these stories were. In the group there, there were a handful of young Muslims. There was a member of a neighboring UU congregation who had grown up um, watching her friends, her Latino friends, harassed by police regularly. <clears throat> there was a mother of a young man who had been shot 50 times by the Anaheim police, unarmed. There were undocumented immigrants. There were people that struggled with mental illness who knew that without their medications, they very easily could become victims of police violence. Then my turn came. I shared my name and I bumbled through an answer to why this was important to me, but I felt it was inadequate somehow. It was an answer, but it wasn't all that sincere. So finally, a group of activists from San Diego and a group from Long Beach arrived at the OCO office to get on the bus with us. I think there were 40 or 50 total. And we boarded that bus just after 11 p.m. and headed to Sacramento. Somehow, I think I managed to get a few hours of sleep, waking here and again to <laughs> find a different crick in my neck. We arrived at Sacramento at 8 a.m. The program was to begin at 9, so there was just enough time to get breakfast and change clothes. And we gathered in a Lutheran church there. As buses, like ours, from across the state arrived with around 1,200 people in total. At that worship service, we honored the family members of those who had been killed by police, and there was a blessing for those of us who were prepared to participate in civil disobedience. And after the service, all 1,200 of us marched from the church for the five or six blocks to the Capitol building. The family members of victims and the volunteers for civil disobedience led the way. We chanted the whole way. No justice, no peace. I hear you, I see you mouthing the words, no racist police. We chanted black lives matter, brown lives matter, native lives matter. We chanted it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. Now once at the Capitol building, the 1200 folks gathered and rallied on the steps. It included more testimonials from victims of police violence, and it expanded the Black Lives Matter focus from black men to lift up the voices of women and transgendered people and American Indians, disabled and homeless, all of those who have been victims of profiling and violence by the police. It was an incredibly inclusive event. Also, Assembly Member Shirley Weber, who had written this piece of legislation, showed up to thank us for being there to exercise our democratic right and responsibility. I wasn't able to see the whole rally because the small group of us, probably 16, I think, who were participating in the civil disobedience team needed to enter the Capitol building quickly. We suspected that the security may stop admitting people once they knew that we intended to take our rally inside. <laughs> so we went up to the sixth floor cafeteria to strategize and to wait for all of those people to get through security to join us. And again, while we got to know each other, the question was asked, why are you here today? And again, there were intensely personal stories. Mothers of children who were people of color, men who had been beaten multiple times by the police. And I managed some answer, but it somehow didn't seem adequate. It wasn't a full truth. It took another hour or so for all the people to file in, and we finally gathered in the hallway outside of Governor Brown's office. As I said, this piece of legislation had made it a long way through a whole lot of hard work. 
but Governor Brown was not supportive. In fact, one of his staffers said in a meeting that it would take an act of God for him to sign it. So we sent people of faith. We sent lots and lots of people of faith to pray and to sing and to chant for hours and to offer our bodies to be arrested at his doorstep. The strategy was to ask to meet with Governor Brown and get him to make a public commitment to sign the legislation. If he wouldn't meet with us and wouldn't commit to signing the bill, then we would shut down his office for two hours or until we were arrested by the Capitol Police. Several hundred people gathered in the hallway outside of his office and when we said that we wanted to meet with him, we were told that he had left the building. Hmm. So we made it very clear that we would accept a phone call. <laughs> then we began chanting and singing. The hallway was packed with people and incredibly loud and hot. Shortly thereafter, as we expected, the police said that we would have to make a pathway for people to get through in case there was an emergency. Those who weren't planning to be arrested cleared a significant amount of space in the hallway, and those of us who were participating in civil disobedience linked arms with one another, creating a circle in the middle of the hallway, blocking the hallway, and blocking anyone from entering or exiting Gov Governor Brown's office. We remained there, linked arm in arm, chanting and singing for two hours. The governor never showed up, or called. The Speaker of the House came and offered her support, but we knew that we needed his signature to make the legislation happen. Well, we expected to get arrested for blocking the hallway, but after maintaining our position for two hours and effectively shutting down the office, we felt our point had been made and it was time to head home. So we weary protesters found our way back to the appropriate buses. By three o'clock, we were on the road headed back to Orange County. We arrived back at the OCO office in Anaheim at about 10 p.m., 24 hours after having arrived there the night before. It was a long and incredibly powerful day. At least three times in the course of that day, I was asked why I was investing my time and energy in doing this sort of work. Why was I opposing identity-based profiling? Why did I care about the Black Lives Matter movement? And all three times, I came up with something that was reasonably <coughs> coherent, but it wasn't a sincere answer. What I learned from this experience was that I need to think through why I am involved in anti-racism work. Showing up is important, but showing up means a whole lot more if you know why you are there. So what I want to share with you now is the better, more complete answer to the question why I care about the movement. It's not my attempt to sell Black Lives Matter to you. It's my thinking through an important question for myself and reclaiming an opportunity that I missed in Sacramento. Now, we each care deeply about different things. Today, I want to invite you to think about your passions and think enough about it so that you can tell the truth about why you care enough to do what you do. So I come to the justice struggle as a gay man. My experience as an outsider is part of, who, part of how I see and understand the world. As a gay man, I've had a glimpse of what it means to not matter. Now, one of the powerful chants that we used in Sacramento, this was actually the first time I heard it, it's the simple call and response. A leader says they think, it's a, they, they think it's a game, and everyone responds with the same words. They think it's a game, or they think it's a joke, 
and everyone responds with the same words. They think it's a joke. They think it's a game. They think it's a joke. They think it's a game. They think it's a joke. They think it's a game. They think it's a joke. Now, I don't know what it's like to be a person of color today, but I know deeply what it means for the suffering of your community to be a game or a joke to the majority of society. It wasn't so long ago that homophobic humor was completely socially acceptable. In some corners of our country, it still is. But just a couple of decades ago, it was the norm. They think it's a game. They think it's a joke. Gay kids killing themselves, running away from homes where they weren't physically safe from their own parents, partners unable to visit each other in the hospital because their relationships aren't illegally recognized. They think it's a game. They think it's a joke. For better or worse, I remember when being gay was a game, a joke to the majority of Americans, and I can't help but feel a sense of solidarity with a community whose suffering continues to be ignored, even mocked occasionally. The struggle for racial justice matters to me because from early on in my activism experience, some wise elders and some very patient peers taught me that fighting for your own rights is not what this is about. In college, I began in activism focused on issues of gay rights because that is all I saw. But I quickly saw that the activists that I really admired were also supporting people of color and women and people with disabilities. And I saw that deeply committed anti-racist activists were supporting the LGBT community. It didn't take long for the strategy to come into focus. Divide and conquer is the oldest strategy in the book. And as long as marginalized groups fought only for their own personal liberation, competing with one another for a larger piece of the pie, then we were all doomed to fail. I learned early on through some painful mistakes that fighting only for white gay men to have more power was not enough. Not only was it not enough, fighting only for my community was being a part of the problem. The struggle for racial justice matters to me because I know that our liberation, our salvation is all tied up together. I am a universalist to my core. It also matters to me because in my short lifetime, I have seen a revolution. I will never forget gathering with my friends in Oklahoma to watch the episode where Ellen DeGeneres came out on TV. It was a big deal. Now we have gays and lesbians openly serving in the military. We have federally recognized same-sex marriage and legal protections for transgender people are coming faster and faster every day. Police who used to raid our bars and humiliate us in the streets are now our allies for the most part. I have watched a radical revolution for my own community and watched in deep confusion as the basic rights of other marginalized groups lag decades behind. Black and brown members of our human family are beaten by police with impunity. The very phrase, Black Lives Matter, is a controversial statement. It's so controversial that presidential candidates are reluctant to even say those words. If they do say them, it comes with a full paragraph of disclaimer. 
Black Lives Matter. In my lifetime, a revolution has occurred for LGBT people, but that's not enough. I'm engaged in this struggle for racial justice because I want desperately to celebrate the liberation of the queer community, but I can't. I can't celebrate because I know that our liberation, our salvation is tied up together and we have not all made it. I'm also part of this struggle because I think my spiritual well-being depends on it. As a white male in America, I was born armed to the teeth with a shield of privilege and weapons of oppression. Every day of my life, our racist and patriarchal society has taught me to use that privilege to maintain the power that I have and to gain as much of it as I can. So I show up in the struggle to learn how to be an ally when I can. I know that if I, as a white man, want to sincerely love other human beings, if I want to embrace peace, I have to work every day of my life to unpack that privilege that I was born with. I have to work every day to carefully manage the weapons of race, gender, and class privilege. There's also a little bit of a selfish motivation. I want desperately to be on the right side of history. And it's become clear to me that the civil rights movement isn't over. How often do we look at history, even photographs, and think, what are those white people doing? Did they really just stand there and gawk at that lynching? Why are they just okay with segregated schools? Why didn't they do something? This is maybe selfish, but I want to be on the right side of history. When people look back 50 years from now in 2065, and we tell our children about the old days, about the Black Lives Matter movement, about ending mass incarceration for people of color in America, about ending police brutality. I want to be a part of that story. I want to be on the right side of history. And every bone in my body tells me that this struggle is the right side. And finally, I should say that I'm engaging in this struggle for racial justice because of you. I am in a position of leadership, and this is a point of ethics that matters. Ministers aren't expected to be saints, thank goodness. But in some ways, we are expected to be role models for ethical living. Whether that's a good thing or not is a whole different conversation. I take the role of leadership somewhat seriously. Not the little stuff. I cuss like a sailor, and I occasionally drink more than anyone thinks is a good idea. I don't pretend to be a saint. But this is too important to not take seriously. I will not be a model for apathy. Because of you, I engage in a struggle for racial justice. Now, believe it or not, this is not an advertisement for the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just trying to put some words to my own beliefs. A Unitarian Universalist faith is one that we each should be able to think about and feel enough to talk about. Each one of us should be able to talk about why you care so much about this world. Why do you love what you love? Why do you do what you do? One of my favorite poems is by Mary Oliver. 
It's incredibly short. She says, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. That's the whole poem. Tell me what it is you plan to do with your wild and precious life. I would simply add to her request, tell me why you want to do it. Amen. As our ushers come forward, We extinguish this flame, knowing the light remains in the warmth and compassion of our hearts until we are together again. Would you take the hand of someone near you for these closing words? It may be a reach. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Now go in peace and let the light within you be a blessing to the world. <laughs>